the title of my message is looking at Christmas from a different perspective. One of the hardest things in Christmas time is everything is familiar. Uh, it's hard for the musicians because they're got, there's only a certain set of songs that are associated with Christmas, and, and we got four weeks and uh, bring those in. That's why they're trying to introduce some new uh, Christmas carols and some maybe some that are not the old familiar songs, but uh, you remember all of our songs were new at one point. And uh, I hope you'll take time to learn some of these new ones as well as enjoy the old ones. Uh, but it's hard to have, you know, after a while, we were saying that song, we sang that song, we sang that song, and how many times do you want to sing it? And that makes it a challenge. And it's also a challenge for the pastor. Have you ever had anybody tell you something like this? Well, stop me if you heard this. And, 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 and you know, and that's what's tough for a pastor because you're preaching a story, you're telling a story that everyone knows and that you have preached every year, in my case, for the past 36 years. And so every year I'm trying to come up with what's a new way to present the old story. Uh, the old story is great. I love to tell the Christmas story, and we ought to hear it every year. But I, I do want to present it in a fresh perspective and maybe get you think about it in a little bit different way. And that's the challenge, and especially with four weeks of Christmas, Sunday morning and Sunday night. So I figured one of the easiest things to do is tell the assistant pastors you're preaching, all right? I get them in there. Uh, pastor Andy, of course, got Waipahu Chapel, and I'll get Pastor Caleb and Pastor Enster to a couple Sunday nights and, uh, and all. But I also wanted to try to take a look tonight at Christmas from a different perspective. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and look at verses 10 through 12. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost, sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we pray that as we hear such a familiar story, one that even many unsaved people know about the wise men and Mary and the shepherds and the angels and sometimes when a story is familiar, we, we just don't listen. We don't pay attention. And I hope that as we look at the story, maybe from a different perspective, from a different point of view, that it might help us to renew the fresh story in our minds. And so we pray that you bless us tonight as we look at your word together. We have the familiar people that we know the story from. We all hear it. We know about the wise men. We know about the shepherds. We know about Mary and Joseph. We know about the manger scene and all of these different things that we've heard year after year, uh, the stories in Luke and Matthew that we read every Christmas. And yet there was other people that are involved in the Christmas story that we don't commonly think about. And the first one that came to my mind, or the first ones, is the prophets. Prophets like Isaiah and Micah. These were prophets that wrote about Jesus but didn't necessarily understand what they were writing about. It's like telling a story you don't know. Telling a story you don't know. Go to Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7 and look at verse number 14. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 14. It says, Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein you trust... Uh, let's see, am I reading? I'm in Jeremiah. Give me a second, right place here. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 14. Let's try this again. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And then turn to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then go over to the book of Micah. It's a little harder one to find. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. It's right after Obadiah and, Habak and, and right, right after um, Jonah. And then you've got Habakkuk and then you've got Micah or Micah and then Habakkuk. So if you can get there, Habakkuk, Micah chapter 5 and verse number 2. Micah chapter 5, verse number 2. But thou, Bethlehem, 
Ephrata, thou, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. And so we've got the prophets prophesying about Jesus' birth. But for them, it was like looking at just a couple pieces of the puzzle. You ever had pieces of puzzle and try and figure out, well, what do these go with? My wife likes puzzles, and we got a whole cabinet full of them, and sometimes they get mixed up, and you get some puzzle pieces that drop out, and I'm looking and say, okay, which puzzle is this piece supposed to be in the box with? And, and this is the way it was for the prophets. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 19 through 21. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 19 through 21. It says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in dark place, until the day dawn, the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of Scripture is in private interpretation. But the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so Isaiah, Micah, David, others in the Old Testament wrote about the coming of Christ and, and his birth. Uh, they were writing about things that they didn't really understand. They were trying to tell a story that is familiar to you and I. But for them, it was like looking at just one or two pieces of the puzzle and, and trying to figure out what was being said. There are over 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, it says, Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken to the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which be interpreted as God with us. And so New Testament said, this is a fulfillment of the prophecy of the Old Testament, of people like David and Micah and Isaiah and others that were writing about the coming of Christ. And when Christ came, it was in what the Bible calls the fullness of time. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 4, it says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. And so you have the prophets writing about Jesus' birth, and yet all they have is just a couple pieces of the puzzle. Can you imagine they were moved by the inspiration of God, which means that where God breathed, that God gave them what to say. Not like he uh, dictated. You can see that he used the personality of every writer in the Bible. You can tell the difference between Paul's writings and Peter's writings. You can tell the difference between what David wrote and what Solomon wrote. Uh, God used their personalities, but yet at the same time, he inspired him. It's like a, a, a sail with the wind. He moved them along. And there's cases where God said, write this exactly as I tell you. And there's other cases where God moved him. And through his supernatural intervention, every word was of God. But yet he was able to also use the personality of the writers. And so much of what they were writing was like they were, they were maybe taking dictation or being moved by God to write this. And, and they wrote things. And they're looking and saying, what was that? Where did that come from? And I'm sure as they wrote that they search diligently. Look again at 1 Peter chapter 1 and look at verse number 11. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 11. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ was, which was in them to signify what it testified beforehand, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. I, I can imagine Isaiah. I can imagine Micah. I can imagine David as they're writing about the baby Christ, the, the birth of Christ. Uh, they were writing and then they stop and they would look at this and say, well, what is that? What does that mean? And, and I wonder how many times Isaiah went back and reread those verses trying to understand them. He wrote them out, and I, I kind of think that over time he went back and said, What does this mean? And I don't know if he ever truly came to understand what it all meant and how Jesus was going to be born in a manger and all the rest of that, but I do know he searched diligently. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 8, it says, And he, talking about Herod, sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. We know, of course, that Herod wasn't there to worship the Christ. But you and I, let's not take something that's familiar and not take time to search diligently. The Bible tells us in John chapter 5 and verse number 39, Search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And I think sometimes we think, well, I know that story. I know about Jesus' birth. And so we kind of skim over those verses instead of really stopping and taking a very close look at what the Bible says. 
In John chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31. John chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31. The Bible says, In many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And so God wrote the scriptures so we can understand who Jesus is and why he was born in a manger, and why he was born that he could die for us so that we could be born again. John chapter 3, you must be born again. Jesus was born so you and I could be born again. Now, we don't know when Jesus' birthday was. It very likely was not December 25th. It, from all we know from the historical record in the Bible and other places as well, we probably would guess probably closer to September sometime in that period, but even there we would be guessing. We don't know exactly when his birthday was. We picked a day and said, this is when we're going to celebrate it, and that's fine. I don't know when I was born again. I don't know the date. I know I was about 14 years old. I can remember bowing my head and my heart to Christ and asking him to come to my life, but I can't give you a date when I was born again, but I do know I was born again. In John chapter 1 and verse number 12, it says, but as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so we don't know exactly when Jesus was born. And of course, Isaiah, Micah, David, when they wrote in the scriptures, they didn't even understand what this all meant. But we do need to search diligently. In 2 Peter 1.19, it says we have a more sure word of prophecy. And we need to be sure of our salvation, 1 John chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. And we need to take time to really think about what this story is truly about. And tonight, I want you to kind of think about it from a different perspective. Again, look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and look at verse number 11. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them to signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. I again can imagine Isaiah and Micah writing these scriptures out as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And then I can imagine them going back and say, okay, what does this mean? What, what is he talking about? You ever talking to somebody and in the middle of your conversation, they change topics. You ever know somebody like, my wife's like that. She'd be talking to me about one thing, and then all of a sudden, she's over here talking about something else. So, what are we talking about now? You, know, you, you ever had that situation where you're talking about one thing, and all of a sudden, it's just like you go to a whole different topic? Go back to the book of Isaiah. Go back to the book of Isaiah again. Look at chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, and look at verses number 5 and 6. When you go back and read in fact, this is true of most of the prophecies about Christ. When you read them in the context, it, it sounds strange. Look at Isaiah chapter 9. Look at verse number 5. And they will deceive everyone his neighbor, will not speak the truth. They have taught their... Oh, I'm in Jeremiah again. Boy, my Bible just keeps turning there. <laughs> They're right there together. Let me get in the right place again. Okay, Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 5 and 6. That was out of context, by the way. All right. <clears throat> For every battle of the warrior is con was confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. If you look at chapter 9, you look at chapter 7, you look at many of the places where they prophesy Jesus being born. In the context, they're talking about war. It's, it's all, he's talking about these great battles and this war that's going on. And he says, and then there's a baby going to be born. And, and I can imagine Isaiah writing his, this all along. And he's writing about war. He's writing about these battles and the conflict is going on. And then all of a sudden he's got this verse about, for unto us a child is born. He's going, what? Right in the middle of one topic, it seems like God just changes the topic. It's in the middle of chaos. It, it's like everything is all falling apart. Look over at Micah chapter 5, Micah chapter 5, and look at verses 1 and 2. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid seeds against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephtha, Ep, thou that be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, who is going forth have been from old, from everlasting. Again, right in the middle of chaos, he brings up the topic of 
the baby being born. Now, Isaiah and Micah are contemporaries. They, were, they lived about the same time period. During their life, there was much corruption in the government of Israel, in religion, in personal lives. It was really a, a bad time for Israel. They were under threat of attack from Assyria. In the middle of all this chaos, God says, unto you a child is going to be born. And he says, the child is going to be called the Prince of Peace. John chapter 14, verse 27, it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Sometimes in our lives, it's chaos. Things are a mess. But God just says, wait a minute. No matter how bad things look, don't forget my son Jesus. And again, I don't think Isaiah understood all of the details of Christ's birth. I don't think he knew about the wise men or Mary or Joseph or the shepherds and the angels. But he did know this. God's promise was true. That he was going to send the Messiah, the Savior. And not only for Isaiah and Micah, but also for even some of the characters we're familiar with, like the wise men. We talk about the wise men took that journey from the east. And again, most Bible scholars think that may have been a two or three year journey. Uh, it was a long journey, no matter what. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 is the passage. We won't turn there now for time's sake, but it talks about them coming at a long journey. And one of the things I wonder about is what caused them to seek Jesus? What caused these wise men from the east, which means they were some, maybe from uh, China or some other place in the east of the Middle East, and, and we don't know exactly where again, but what caused these wise men from the east to go on this long journey looking for the king? In Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search me with all your heart. Now, a lot of Bible scholars think that the reason they were looking for the Messiah was because of Daniel. They may have been from Assyria and that area there, and maybe they, they heard about Daniel and knew the stories of Daniel. I, I don't think that they had a copy of the Bible. And the reason I don't think that is when they got to Jerusalem, what, did the, what was the first thing they did? They went to the king, Herod, and said, where is the Christ child? And Herod went to his um, his Bible scholars and said, look it up. Now, these were wise men. And I think if Herod's Bible scholars, who were just religious men and not saved, could find it, these wise men surely could have found Bethlehem in Isaiah or Micah. They could have found the source. So I don't think they had the whole Bible. At the best, they may have known about Daniel and may have heard the stories of, of his prophecies and what he had done and his God. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, So faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. They didn't have what you and I have today. But yet, on the little they had, they went seeking Christ. Now, there's many ways to come to Jesus, but there's only one way to get to heaven. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And these wise men had to come to Jesus the same way everybody else does. And they had to find him, the Savior that was born in the manger to die on the cross for them. The shepherds is another one. The shepherds were out doing their job, and all of a sudden these angels appear. And the angel appears, and, and a multitude of heavenly hosts start singing, or, or at least saying, and, and, and they're sitting there just doing their job, and all of a sudden, they're hearing the story of Jesus. And go over to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and one of the passages we read in Christmas time, and we read this morning, in Luke chapter 2, verse 20. In verse 14, it says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. That's the angel speaking. But in verse 20, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, and it was told unto them. They went out to give glory and praise to God. And that's what you and I ought to be doing at Christmas time. Is these were shepherds. These were uneducated men. The shepherds were really the minimum wage job of their day. It, it didn't take a whole lot to be a shepherd out in the fields, especially at night. You were just kind of the, sorry, Tupu, the security guards. And they were just out there doing their job, 
And then they got called away. Now, if that had been, they'd been worked for Tupa, they'd been fired for leaving the security job and not doing what they're supposed to do. But the angel said, come and see. And they, they came and saw the Christ child. And what they went out and said, let, let me tell you what God, what I just saw God do. And that's all God asked from you and I, is to praise him. In Luke chapter 2 and verse number 13, and suddenly it was with the angel, multitude heavenly host, praising God and saying, in Psalms 107, verse 8, it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works for the children of men. It says the same thing in verse 15, verse 21, verse 31. And that's our job, is to give praise to the Lord. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 18, all, that, all they that heard it, it wondered at these things which were told them by the shepherds. And I hope that you and I will never lose the wonder of Christmas. I hope that we'll never listen to the Christmas story being read and think, well, I've heard that before. I hope that it'll never become just something that we review every year. But it'll always be exciting and an opportunity to praise God and give glory to him. And then Mary also, in Luke chapter 2, verse 19, says, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The word pondered comes from the idea of the word to uh, put it all together. It's like when you buy a Christmas present and Christmas Day, you open it up, and then the back of the box or Christmas Eve, you're getting ready to put in a package for your children, and the back of the box says, some assembly required. That phrase is Chinese for you better have a rocket science degree to put this together. And God says, listen, you need to ponder these things in your heart. Now, Mary had been visited by an angel. And we know her story from a little bit earlier on. But I can still imagine her just watching all this going on. She didn't know all these angels were going to show up or shepherds were going to come or later on the wise men come. She didn't know all the details of the story, but she pondered them. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as you always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For as God was working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God works in us to save us, but we need to work it out. We need to assemble these things and ponder them. And since you also kept these things in her heart in verse 19, but Mary kept all these things. Look at verse number 51. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Now, I preached this before in a different message, and again, it's hard to... It's, you know, tell the Christmas story without repeating some things, but the word kept is two different words in these verses. In verse number 19, it means to keep in memory. Go over to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Verses 12 through 16. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them. And be established in the present truth. Yea, you think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to put you in, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables we made known to you, the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but why witnesses of majesty. To the world, the Christmas story is just a fable. It's just a fairy tale. It's no different than Santa Claus. But to you and I, it's the wonder of God. I can imagine, Isaiah wrote a lot of the Bible. He wrote, he wrote quite a few chapters. But I got to believe until the end of his life, he would keep going back to that verse and say, what does it mean a child's going to be born? I imagine Micah did the same thing. Mary, who knew a little bit of what was coming, yet she, she pondered these things in her heart. And we know this story, but let it become fresh and new to you every year. The second word for kept in Luke chapter 2, verse 51, it means to watch carefully, continually to observe. Make it your goal every Christmas to learn something new about the Christmas story. What I'm preaching tonight, a lot of this is new. I never really thought about Isaiah and Micah and how it felt to them. I never really thought about the fact that here you've got a verse about the birth of 
of Jesus in the middle of a chapter of chaos and war. It's interesting to think about it from a new perspective. To ponder it in your heart, to keep it. Go back to Luke chapter 2. There's a couple of people I really want to quickly go through and looking at the Christmas story with, and that's in Luke chapter 2, and beginning with verse number 25. This is somebody who was just dying to see Jesus. Literally, he was dying to see Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, verse 25, and it says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. It was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ, the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit in the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of the people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many of Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now, we know about Mary, we know about Joseph, we know about the wise men, the shepherds, but you all, I don't see any, any little simians on the shelf. It's not something we commonly think of in relation to Christmas. And yet this was a man that God said, you're not going to die until you see the Christ child. And so he was just dying to see Jesus. Now, the Bible calls him a just man. In Romans chapter 3, verse 24, it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption is in Christ Jesus. A just man is somebody who is justified, just as if I'd never sinned. So Simeon was a, a man who was saved. He was a devout man. Go over to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Same word is used here in Acts chapter 10 and verse number 2. Acts chapter 10, verse 2, it says, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. And then verse number seven. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called the two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. So a devout man wasn't necessarily a saved man. Because at this time, Cornelius was not yet saved. That's why Peter was going to come to tell him about Jesus. He was a man who believed in God and was seeking God. And when you seek God, God's already seeking you. He'll find you. So a devout man is somebody who is religious, who is committed to what he believes. And Cornelius was committed to what he believed at that point. And then he got saved and I became, he became not only a devout man, but a just man as well. Now in Luke chapter 2 and verse 26, it says, It revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death, before he'd seen the Lord Jesus. So Simeon would go to the temple every day because he was a devout man. And he went to the temple and he was waiting. Every day he'd wake up and think, maybe today will be the day. Maybe today I'll see the Christ of God. Could you imagine what it was like to wake up every day knowing that you were going to see Jesus before you died? And today might be that day. What do you wake up every day hoping to see? Do you wake up in the morning and say, I want to see Jesus? Like those men that came to the disciples and said, Sir, we would see Jesus. Do you wake up every day saying, Maybe today Jesus is going to come again? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Simeon woke up every day with the expectation that today was going to be the day. We don't know how old he was. But it seems like, as you read the Bible Scripture, he was probably pretty old. He probably lived a long life. But he woke up every day saying, today, today I'm going to see, get, see Jesus. What about you? Do you wake up with a desire to see Jesus before you die? Do you wake up every day with a desire to say, today, Lord, let me see you? Even so, today, come, Lord Jesus. 
In Luke chapter 2, verse 29, it says, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Are you trusting in the word of God? He said, no, Lord, I'm ready to do whatever you want. I'm ready to die according to your word. And look at Luke chapter 2, verse 25. It says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and about, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Now, the consolation of Israel, we think of a consolation as like a consolation prize. I didn't get first place, but I got second place. Don't let Jesus ever be your consolation prize. Don't ever let him be your consolation prize. Wake up every day and say, today, the best thing that could happen to me is to see Jesus. Then there's another one right after this passage that the Bible talks about. We don't often think of in relation to Christmas, and that's in verse number 36 of Luke chapter 2. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of uh, Phanuel of the tribe of Aser. She was of great age and lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thank likewise unto the Lord and spake of unto all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And so here was a lady, Anna, who was just waiting. And, and she was also there at the temple and she was, she was looking for the Christ. You see, for her, it was more than just Christmas and Easter. For her, she wanted to be there. She said, I'm not going to miss going to the temple because I want to be there today in case today is the day that Jesus comes. That's why I go to church, not just to come here and preach. I don't want to miss a service because today's the day the Lord might speak to me. Today's the day the Lord might speak to my heart. She was a woman who served God. Psalms 100 and verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. Now, it says she was of great age, and it sounds like she was even a little bit older than I am. And yet she was serving the Lord night and day. But look how she served God in verse number 37. But serve God with fastings and prayers. She was in age she couldn't come to work days. She was in age it was probably too hard to work in the nursery. She'd probably been maybe a Sunday school teacher for many years, but couldn't do that anymore. She was in age that all she could do was prayer and fastings. But the Bible doesn't say that's all she could do. That says, that's, she said, the Bible says that's how she served God. You and I can serve God through prayer and fasting. And she gave thanks. 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. This Christmas, you ought to take time to give God thanks for his son, Jesus Christ. The fact that he came to die on the cross is is an amazing thought. But to me, just as amazing is that he was born as a baby. Jesus never stopped being God, but he limited himself. And he did not use those powers that he had. And so for those first few days and years of his life, he was a little baby that had to be carried everywhere. He was a little baby that had to have his diaper changed to be fed with a spoon by his mom. Why did they take him to the temple? To be circumcised. This was God. Yet he put himself in a place that he was limited. I don't understand it all, but I don't think... He was like you and I. I think he still understood his godness. And I think even as a baby, could you imagine you understand everything, but you can't do anything? He limited himself. And we ought to give thanks for that. We ought to give thanks. And she says, I I, I just got to tell everybody about this. In Acts chapter 4, verse 20, it says, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And that's what we ought to be doing this Christmas season. The world thinks of it as a fable, a fairy tale. They're just nice stories. But you and I, we understand the wonder of it all. And so I hope tonight, maybe you'll go back and do a little bit of Bible study and Isaiah and David and the Psalms and Micah and other places in the Old Testament and read about the prophecies of the coming of Christ. And 
And by the way, it was also like two pieces, the two puzzles were mixed together. Because you'll read in the same place it talks about Jesus coming as a baby, it also talks about him coming as the Messiah, as the conqueror. And, 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 and so it's like they got two different puzzles they're trying to assemble at the same time. But it's just fascinating to go back and read those stories in the context. And then just to sit and think, what was it like for Isaiah to write that and not understand it from our perspective? What was it like for Micah and David? To go back and look at even these familiar characters like the wise men and the shepherds and Mary. We sometimes think they know as much as we do, did, do, but they didn't. They only had a few pieces of the puzzle themselves. And yet they pondered and wondered and kept it in their heart. And then Simeon, a just man, a devout man. A man who woke up every day saying, today... Today is the day I get to see Jesus. Maybe today is that day. I'm going to die, but it's worth it. Or like Anna, who served the Lord well into her later years with prayer and fasting. Was faithful to him. And God honored death. Let's bow in prayer.